Well, hey, everybody. It's really nice to have everyone here today. Uh, I, I'm just going to talk a little bit about you know, some of the cool new features that I really like in Photo Raw 2018 and, and some of sort of my workflow uh, basics that I, that I, the old standbys I go to. I'm going to run through here and mostly use some images uh, just from the last couple workshops that I've done over the past couple months uh, from Silver Creek Falls right here around Portland, Oregon a really, really beautiful park that we've got here. And I'm also gonna take some from, from Moab, actually, this month. Uh, I took my family to Moab. We had a really nice time out in the desert. The weather was great. Uh, and also had a really great time with a fun group of people. Uh, we did this workshop. The weather was fantastic. Um, got into some really, really cool areas. And I'm gonna use some of those photos to kind of showcase some of the cool new things that we have in Photo Raw and the ways that I use them. And at the same time, we're gonna answer a whole bunch of your questions. So, you know, we'll interrupt to uh, to jump in with questions. Michael's gonna be kind of monitoring the questions that you guys send in. And then we'll just, we'll make sure we save a little time at the end for Q&A. Yeah, um, so, so if, if anyone does have any questions during the whole webinar, use that questions panel on the right side. I'll be there typing away, answering your questions. and. I'll uh, jump in if Hudson needs to see anything right away, and we'll just do a nice interactive Q&A throughout the whole webinar. Yeah, so really loose format. You know, you guys ask away anything you want to know, you know, gear, technique, field stuff, editing, you name it, it's all fair game. So, um, you know, I, I thought I'd start off with this set of bracketed images that I captured. Uh, it's at Lower Park Avenue in, uh, in Moab, and it was, you know, Dawn Light came in and it struck this, this feature called the organ. I'm gonna go into the thumbnail view here and browse. Uh, and it was really, really brightly lit, beautiful sky with some interesting clouds. Uh, but you know, the way that it's set up there, the Park Avenue has these beautiful cliffs with cool features like the three gossips um, on them. And they block the light from really striking the foreground. And I found this really cool tree that I wanted to use as a foreground subject, but you know, I knew that if I got it properly exposed, you can see here in the histogram, the foreground's really nicely exposed, but the sky and the organ are totally blown out. And to be safe, I decided I would bracket this scene. So I set up my tripod and I photographed it two stops underexposed on the, on the meter reading and then two stops overexposed just to make sure that I captured all of that dynamic range. And I took a look at my camera's histogram when I'm doing that and I see that I've got plenty of room you know, that I'm not overexposing the highlights and that underexposed image. The middle reading, it's kind of going off the charts both ways a little bit. Uh, and then that overexposed image really has all the shadow detail. You know, we've lost the highlights. And the neat thing about Photo Raw is right here in Browse, you know, if I jump back into my grid view here, thumbnail view, uh, I can just select these three images and without even touching them, they're just straight raw out of the camera, I go ahead and hit this HDR button. and Raw's really quickly going to go through here and pull up a preview of what this image blended looks like. And you can kind of choose, you know, do I want a natural look? Do I want a surreal look? I I'm definitely more of a natural guy. Anybody that follows me knows I'm really looking for, for just the look that the actual scene had when I was out there. And you can choose which image to kind of base the whole thing off of. You know, I want to make sure that I get the one that's protecting the sky. And I know the shadows are going to be in there. And this HDR, uh, you know, dialogue panel that we've got here, it comes up and it gives you sort of some of your basic tone and color adjustments from develop. And it also gives you an HDR look filter that's just automatically applied that will be in effects. And the neat thing is, you know, you're, you're building a linear, basically a new raw file that has all this tonal information built in from all three files. Any adjustments I do here, they're not permanent. As soon as I create this new file, I can jump back in to develop an effects and, and edit these any way I want. All I really want to do, particularly, you know, I tend to tone the HDR filter down just a little bit. I really like a natural look. So, and I'd rather do that kind of work in my finish edit anyway. I just want to make sure that if I pull shadow detail, I've got everything I want and I see that I do here. So, you know, it's as simple as going in there and clicking that. I choose where I want the file to open after it's built and I, I wanna jump into develop. I could choose effects or returning to browse, but I'm gonna go ahead and use develop. And the only other setting to think about here is ghosting. You know, in this image, there's hardly any ghosting. Ghosting is what happens when things are moving in your image in between capturing, 
your bracketed series. So let's say people were flowing through the scene or waves are moving in the ocean. And that's how the software is going to kind of blend things that move and, and choose one image over another and, and get all of that kind of lined up. So in this case, you know, I'm going to use low deghosting. I could choose medium, high, very high. In this case, low or even off and, and clicking this button just kind of gives you a red overlay of what that ghosting is doing on the on the scene so all i'm going to do is is go ahead click save and it's going to take it a second um you know it's it's doing a whole lot of processing plus these are nikon d850 files so we're working with you know 46 megapixel raw files here so it's it's not going to be instantaneous but it's going to build us this linear file with all of that tonal range from the three bracketed images built in and this is so much faster than the way I used to do this. You know, back in the days of film, I would use graduated neutral density filters, and you'd have a way darkened feature like the organ that's up with the sky and the frame. And, and you know, you'd have to do a lot of work in Photoshop to even pull tonal, to make it look like it should fit into the rest of the scene. It's going to go ahead now and open that in develop. Uh, and then I started capturing bracketed series like this, but I didn't really like the way that automated HDR software worked. And so I would go in and put it in layers and hand blend the shadows back into the scene that's exposed for the highlights. And, and that's just a lot of work. Look at how quick and easy this is. And so, you know, now that I've got this laid out here, some of the things that I really love in RAW, we're still working on the on a RAW file here, non-destructively, just metadata editing. I'm going to go ahead and grab my local graduated adjustment brush here. I'm going to drop it in here, flip it over, and I just want to brighten this foreground a little bit. So it's like using a graduated filter in the field, but I'd much rather use it here in post-production where I can, I can precisely watch what's happening. Uh, and I'm going to just boost exposure a little bit on that foreground. Not a lot, just a little bit. At the same time, I'm going to pull the shadows back to get a little bit more contrast in that. Uh, and, and boost contrast even more, maybe pump that up just a little bit. What I don't want to be doing is, is brightening the sky. I really like that, that, that dark blue in the sky. So that's why I'm choosing to just kind of brighten this with a graduated filter on the foreground. Um, I could also paint it in with a local adjustment brush. And, and so, you know, I've, I've got that foreground just brightened a little bit differentially here. I'm going to go back into my develops overall settings and just set the black point and the white point. That's usually my starting point. I'm going to hold down the J key here. Uh, so I'm holding down J, which gives me, I could also click up here and, and just turn on an, an overlay that shows me highlights and shadows that are being clipped. That's just to turn it on permanently. Now, if I move whites, I'm going to see the the whites clip. If I pull blacks, I'm going to see the shadows clip in blue. Also, just holding the J key down does the exact same thing for you. So that's a really good thing to do at this stage in the process. You want to hold down J. You want to get right where you're starting to clip the shadows. You got some pure black in the image. And then, uh, you know, I like to move my whites to where, you know, it's starting to, in this case, I don't want to move it too far, but I want to get as much contrast out of the scene as I can. And then I can get the skies tonal range back with with pulling some highlights back and creating more contrast in the highlights. And, you know, I can play with my midtones. I might brighten those up just a little bit. And I'm really getting kind of the look that I want. If I take a look at what this looked like before, it's a dramatic improvement, you know, just increasing that, that tonal range so much by combining those bracketed images. And then the next thing I want to do is do some finish editing. And I'm going to jump into effects. And I've still got that HDR look filter which I could, you know, I could get rid of, turn up, turn down. Maybe I'll just blend the opacity down just a little bit to get the look that I'm wanting. And I want to add some dynamic contrast to the organ, this big rock, this, this feature here at Moab called the organ. It's in Arches National Park and to the foreground. But I don't want to necessarily apply it to the clouds in the sky. So I'm going to show you a really quick way to just mask the sky out for a filter here. I'm going to go ahead, add some dynamic contrast. To me, that even natural setting, the basic natural setting is a little too much. I have my own style I've created. And anytime you're using effects filters and over and over, you're kind of getting the same settings that you like, you can just go in here and save a new style and name it. So I've got my own dynamic contrast style saved here. And it just, it just blends a little bit of small detail dynamic contrast, a little bit more medium detail, a little bit more large, but less than the natural setting. And then it blends the opacity of that filter back a little bit just to make it a little softer touch. Uh, but it still gives that little bit of pop, that little clarity, that little extra sharpening that really makes the scene. 
But let's say I don't want to add that to the clouds because they're starting to get to that little edge of surreal. And I know as I go through my finish edits, that's going to get enhanced. So I don't necessarily want it in the sky. Well, I'm going to go here into my masking controls. And one of the things I love is, is the way that the luminosity masking is working in here. If I go ahead and click luminosity, I'm not necessarily going to just use luminosity masking, but it's going to give me a really nice starting point to get the sky masked out of here. You can see right now it's set to kind of mask the shadows out. I'm going to go ahead and invert that so we're masking the highlights out and then have a look at it on the screen. And all I have to do is sort of pull this levels slider and we're going to get those edges around the rocks masked out. See how that works? So for a lot of my image, I've just done a really nice mask. Now I want to go ahead and touch that up a little bit. So I've already got my masking brush selected here when I'm when I'm working on the mask, and I've got paint out selected in 100%. I want to go ahead and turn on my perfect brush. I'm just going to reduce the size of this mask a little bit. I'm oh I'm still paint out. I want to paint in. Let me go ahead and undo that move. I'm just going to start kind of clicking around the edge of the rocks, or you know I, I often use a Wacom tablet for this. I'm using a mouse right now. I'm just doing multiple clicks along the edge. And that perfect brush is looking at color and tone, and it's not, you know, you'll notice I'm not moving that crosshair into the sky, or else I'd start painting out the sky. And I'm just kind of getting the edge of these rocks out, that, that masked in. So they're going to be included in that dynamic contrast mask. And I'm just going to kind of paint them and then click. Same thing goes here. There's a little bit of rock that got clicked out because it's almost the same luminosity as the sky. I'm just getting that edge sort of included in the frame the way I want it. That's pretty good. There's a little bit right here. And then, you know, I'm not going to go into all the levels of detail to zoom in and, and get this all 100% perfect, but I think you see how it's working. Just some little quick clicks are including those tones. That perfect setting is amazing. And then I'm just going to turn that off and go ahead and, and paint the interior out. So I'm turning off the perfect brush setting. And now, oops, I'm going to undo that. And this is, a, this is a reason to do small, let go of the brush every now and then. That way, if I make a mistake, I don't lose everything I've been doing for a while. I'm just going to go ahead and paint that out. And as you get into it, easier areas to paint, you can go ahead and increase your brush size. You can either just hover over size, click, and drag to the right, or you can use the bracket keys on your keyboard. The, the, the left bracket decreases the brush size. Oops. The right bracket increases. And I'm just going to kind of paint this so that the whole thing is pretty much masked out. You get the idea. It's pretty easy to go in and really get just the mask you wanted. And I think that luminosity masking and the finer controls on it that we have right now really are helping with making that just a piece of cake. And that's probably good enough for our purposes here. We're getting pretty darn close. I would go in, zoom in, and, and really touch this up tightly. Uh, but I, you know, it'd take a few extra minutes and I don't want to burn all of our time on this one image. So you get the idea. I'm going to go ahead and turn off that view um, just with the O key. The O key is going to toggle the mask view. And, uh, and then you take a, oops, I forgot one thing. We're going to go back and have a look here. One thing that's important and really easy, oops, let's paint it out. We're going to flip paint out and just get the rest of the sky that wasn't near the rock. That's the thing that I think the luminosity mask did for us that was the easiest, was get that edge between the sky and the rock. Um, that just saved a lot of time. So there you go. Now, if I turn that mask off and you take a look at what's happening, that dynamic contrast is not being applied to the sky at all. And as long as I've got this mask made, I'm going to go ahead and copy it in case I want to use it on a later filter. So I go ahead and collapse that filter. The next one I want to add is a color enhancer. And I might select desert. That's going to just bring in some reds in the desert colors and enhance the sky a little bit. And I think the reds are a little more than I want, so I'm going to back just the overall opacity down. I'm pretty happy with the whole scene, though. Uh, and I might want to enhance that blue in the sky just a little bit more. So I'm going to showcase how you could use that, that mask that we just created. I'm going to go ahead and color enhancer here and add a sky color enhancer. 
And again, I might back that down a little bit or choose the blues and pull back on saturation just a little bit in that color enhancer. And then I'm gonna go ahead, click on the mask controls and just paste that mask back in. Well, now it's not happening in the sky. We created a mask that would only apply the effect, the filter effect to the foreground. All I have to do is click invert and now that's only being applied to the sky. So you get you get that idea that it's pretty darn cool. Um, so there you go. That's just to me showcasing a lot of the power that we have in Photo Raw 2018 to a T. And if you take a look at what we had to begin with, you know, it's really really amazing. So much easier than doing this kind of stuff in the past and it really gives the look that I want. So now when I'm out looking at scenes and I have a lot of contrast in the scene, I'm even more inclined to go ahead and bracket it and make sure that I've captured all the tonal range because I know how easy it's gonna be to combine in post. Um, so there, there you go, that, that's the first, uh, the first thing I love about Photo Raw 2018 is that HDR blending and how easy it is. We got any questions on that, Michael? There's actually a, uh, a few questions on um, your photo kit <laughs> that you have out right now. Um, one of the questions being just about focus blending and um, it looked to a couple customers like you maybe had uh, blended two images of focus together on the last one. I don't know if they were talking about the dynamic range filter or not, but uh, I didn't know if you had anything you wanted to show us on focus blending specifically. It looks like there are quite a bit of questions on that type of stuff. <laughs> well, this is a focus blended image right here. And you know, I'm not gonna go into the whole thing. If you guys check out the focus or the, the, the photo kit, yes, there is a, a video just dedicated to how I created this particular image right here. Um, I'm, I'm literally inches from this rock with the leaf on it. This is at Silver Creek Falls during my workshop last month. Um, and, or actually it was in September now that I think about it, late September. Um, and I'm inches away from that rock with my 14 millimeter lens. And even so, there was no way in a single image to get everything razor sharp from background to foreground. So this, th this is captured in two images. One sort of hyperfocal distanced at, to capture as much from infinity to as close to me as possible. And then a second image that was captured at what I like to call the reverse hyperfocal distance, which captures as much of the scene from the, the, the closest foreground element towards infinity. And, and I talk a little bit about how I do that in that video. It's a pretty simple process using live view on a modern DSLR. You know, I don't think you need any apps or, or any, you know, notes on which lens, what setting. I think that using live view is just really easy to find those two settings these days. It just takes seconds. Um, and once you capture those two images, I, I just hand blend them in layers. It's a really easy thing to do with Photo Raw 2018. Um, and, and so that video goes through how to do that. Um, it's, it's really a piece of cake. And that's another situation, a lot like tonal contrast where we just talked about HDR. There are scenes that you encounter where you really want something close in the foreground and something, you know, at infinity all to be razor sharp and in focus. And in the past, using a wide angle lens and stopping way down was really the only way to do that. Well, these days, you know, just capturing those close focused images and the infinity focused image and blending them in post-production is a piece of cake. And it lets you keep your camera uh, set at a more optimal aperture. So, you know, if you stop all the way down to F22 when you're out in the field, you're probably introducing diffraction, which robs you of a little overall sharpness, even on the things that are razor sharp and focused to the best of your ability. So your lens is designed to perform at its sharpest in between F8 and F18 in almost every case. That's where the engineers kind of put the sweet spot in the lens. So this focus blending technique lets you stay in that sweet spot and really capture higher quality images. Awesome, good stuff, man. Why don't you uh, keep on going? And uh, as I mentioned earlier, everyone, there is a questions panel in your uh, webinar control panel. So if you have any questions throughout the webinar, just go ahead and ask them right in there and I'll be able to send them right over to Hudson here. So keep on going, buddy. All right, well, I have a few uh, panoramas in here and that, that's another thing that, that I cover pretty in depth in the photo kit, but I wanted to showcase some of you know, the things that I love in Photo Raw. 
Uh, one of them is the ability to work on these panos. And, and I'm working with a Mac Pro uh, computer, you know, Apple's kind of top of the line system here. This is a really, really big panorama. Um, it's 24,000 pixels wide, just about. So it's shot with the, the Nikon D850. And you can see that even with this fast computer with 64 gigabytes of RAM, it's taken it a while to zoom in here to see all the detail that we have in here. Um, the, the things that I love about panoramas are the ability to get really, really huge prints. There you go. That gives you just an idea. You know, that's that's the, the quality that we're talking about in here. Even moving around and working with it is just a little bit cumbersome. But I'm going to tell you the quality of the print that you get out of this and the ability to enlarge it is just incredible. Uh, as compared to a single frame. So if I jump back and, and show you this is a, a single frame image, it's great, but you know, you're not able to get the size, the same size print that you can capturing a panorama. And and also you can get wider scenes. You know, in this case, I'm using a longer lens and I chose to create a panorama. You know, I shot this at 90 millimeters and this this panorama is photographed at uh, gosh, what is it, 125 millimeters. But it, it lets you get higher resolution. It lets you get a wider scene in situations where you do work with a wide angle lens. And it's just fun to create these huge images and print them large. And I've got a few images from this. You know, if I did the whole thing, it would take us a little too much time. But I thought I'd show you how just a few images from this panorama blend. And once again, you know, if you just select them, I tend to like to do a little bit of tonal adjustments in advance. I'll jump into develop here if we look at the thumbnail view and develop. Um, we'll be able to see the three images that I selected are all selected. And, you know, the, I just sort of set the white point and black point. I'll hold down that J key like we talked about before. Oops, I hit the wrong key there. I'll hit the J key and I'll pull the blacks a little bit and just get to where we're, we're, we've got as much contrast in the image as possible. I'll pull the whites a little bit. You know, we, we've got quite a bit to work with there. I'll boost the shadows. Just get the tone set a little bit in the image pull highlights back some you know i might i might even uh pull mid-tones up a little bit and pull these whites back some just get kind of the look that i want in the image and then go back into browse and i'll just synchronize those three images so that all those tonal adjustments are done on all three of them and they're all exposed the same. You know, one of the keys to getting a good panorama in the field is to make sure that you lock in manual settings. So we're gonna lock in exposure and that includes not having auto ISO turned on in your camera. Um, if you have auto ISO turned on, it's gonna be varying exposure for each separate image. You wanna lock the white balance and, and all of your exposure settings when you're capturing. So you wanna be in manual mode and you wanna keep the camera nice and level. And, and once you've got your slight tonal adjustments done, I like to just click this pano button. And, and I left this warning thing up because I think, you know, OM1 is committed to continuing to improve their panorama feature. What's not working so well right now is when you forget and you use an automatic mode and your, your images have a lot of exposure variation between them. So let's say you left auto ISO on and there's a really bright part of your scene and a really dark part of your scene. Um, it's going to have a trouble blending them. And right now, it's, it's preview isn't always necessarily perfectly um, perfectly accurate. But it, you can see here that tonally, it's blended this thing perfectly, and the edges all look great. And we have several choices here. You can, you can choose how it's going to treat the edges. I shot this on a tripod level. So you can see there's, there's not that much shift in these images. That's the actual edges. Um, and you can have it either crop those edges to the to the closest rectangle that it can, or you can have it do some some content aware warping where it's going to actually fill in those spaces based on the imaging. You can you can kind of have a, a little preview here of how it looks if we're warping. It looks pretty good in this deserty section, and skies always do really well with warping. So at this case, you know, as many pixels as I can get, I'm going to go ahead and choose warp to fill. But that's always your choice. You can have it do nothing. You could have it crop the image or you can have it warp. And again, where am I going to open this? I'm going to have it open and develop and I just click save. And uh, Photo Raw is going to go ahead and blend this panorama. And, and I think you'll be surprised how good it looks straight out of that. It takes a little bit of time again. These are 46 megapixel files. 
But, um, you know, I love the fact that it's available here. It's a really simple interface. And, and for me, I've had no problem uh, with it blending images so long as I'm thoughtful when I capture them. You know, I think the key, whenever you think about capturing a panorama is to make sure that you have all your settings locked. As I said, you know, you, you don't want, auto ISO is the killer. That's the one that I always find myself forgetting and then regretting when I get home and try to blend the images. I'm like, oh, geez, you know, I, I forgot about auto ISO. And, and I think that for those of us using the latest cameras, auto ISO is a godsend when you're running around handheld and changing light conditions. Um, I really like to, to kind of run and gun in aperture priority mode with auto ISO turned on so that it, it's keeping my hand holding speed right where I want it. The cameras are so smart. They know what lens you've got. They know whether that lens has vibration reduction built into it uh, or image stabilization built into it. And, and they know what shutter speed you can handhold given where you're zoomed in on that lens and it'll just adjust iso to keep a shutter speed that you can work with to have everything sharp um, and you know for those of you that are watching this panel build it, it takes a while for a panorama to build no matter what software you're using uh, you know photoshop takes its time lightroom takes its time here we go it's going to save this composite photo now and it's going to go ahead and open it in develop hey uh hudson I had a few, yeah. uh, while you were talking about the new the new cameras, I had a few customers actually ask about the new Nikon D850 and uh, how it was treating you. So I don't know if you had any thoughts you wanted to add on to that here while you're waiting on this pano to merge in. You know, I, I recently put together kind of a holiday gift guide list of things that I really like this year for photographers on my blog. And anybody that wants to find that, just go to HudsonHenry.com and look at the blog. It's up at the top. And the D850 is sitting there prominently as my favorite camera I have ever had. Um, it's not just how well it handles um it handles mega, you know, its resolution. It's that it's working really, really well in low light for such a high resolution camera, like kind of surprisingly well in low light for such a high resolution camera. It's got really fast processing. You know, it, it'll handle se seven frames per second for a really long time, like 50, 60 images with these 46 megapixel RAW files. And it just feels really, really good in my hand. Um, since the since the days of film and the Nikon F100, I haven't really liked a camera, the feel of it, as much as I like both the D500 and the D850. And any complaint that I had with the D810 has really been addressed in the D850. I think it's just a fantastic camera. And, and since I like to dabble a bit in video and also you know, doing tutorial videos for you guys, um, the video quality is just astounding and it and it's doing 4k video sensor wide you know that was that was a thing that was a little bit uh, sad in the the Nikon d500 was it does beautiful 4k video but it it crops to the center 4k of the sensor so that even with my 14 millimeter lens it's it's like a three times crop factor it's like working with an even smaller sensor than a micro four thirds camera with that lens whereas the d850 lets me do really true big beautiful wide angle 4k um, so there's just a lot to love about it i i am a huge huge fan and the uh the focus stacking feature is really cool. I've just started kind of playing with that and I, I do love it. It's great. So awesome. I can't recommend it highly <laughs> enough. Yeah. Good. And, and I'm, I'm going to be doing a blog post about it. The other thing I'd say um, it, that I, I, I got a couple of different uh, uh, L brackets and, and I've, I've actually become an ambassador for Kirk Enterprises. I really like their camera support products. They sent me an L bracket. It's really beautiful. It, it's a work of art that fits on that camera so nicely. It's got a really kind of cool, innovative built-in um, Allen key holder that fits in the bottom for a full-size Allen key. And it's just really, really nice. But I also got a L bracket from Sunway Photo. They wanted me to check their their L brackets out, and it's also really nice. And and you know it's a it's about a sixth of the cost. So it just depends on whether you want something that's kind of state of the art industrial design, like like really right stuff for Kirk. And I like Kirk a little bit better. Um, or you know if you want to to save a little bit of money and get the better camera, but save a little bit on your L bracket. Um, the Sunway photo, they're on Amazon. I've got a link on that same gift for photographer's guide to both of those. 
Um, and I think that anytime you're getting a new camera, the L bracket should be the first thing you order. You know, whether you work with a fluid head like me and you absolutely have to have it because it won't flip sideways to get vertical, or whether you're working with a uh, a ball head, ball heads are so awkward when you flip them over to get the camera vertical. The L bracket just makes it a, a breeze to just loosen that clamp, flip it to vertical and tighten the clamp again. Um, and I just think it's essential if you wanna work quickly in the landscape. So and, here, here we have that. Oh, oh, go ahead. Before you go on Hudson, I just wanna let everyone know, I did drop the link for Hudson's blog for the uh, stocking stuffers into uh, the chat window there. So if anyone does wanna go check that out, feel free to click on that. Otherwise, Hudson, why don't you just keep on going on with On One Photo Raw 2018. Yeah, so here you guys go. We've got that pano uh, and we we've, it's all blended in here, looking really good. As you can see, there's no tonal problems whatsoever. Um, I'm sitting in develop right now and I would probably just do, you know, a touch more tonal adjustment, maybe pull these whites back, pull the highlights back a little bit, get that sky popping a little bit. And I can see I've got a little sensor dust and you can see how it repeats the same two specs because we're doing a pano and those images are blended. Um, so I always choose to do this after the blending. And one thing I'll do is I'll pull up contrast a little bit just to see them a little bit better. And I tend to use the just the, the 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 healing brush here. The perfect eraser is great if they're in a complicated space, but they usually don't even show up if they're in a complicated part of your image. Um, but you know, if you have any problem with the healing brush, just jump to the perfect eraser. It's just that, particularly with big files like panoramas, the uh, the perfect eraser can take quite a bit of time. So I'm just going through and zapping those. Um, get rid of those little bits of sensor dust. You can see this one hardly even shows up because it's in the clouds. I don't even know if I'd address it. It just looks like a feature in the cloud. So if I did, I'd probably jump over to the perfect uh, eraser again. And you know, I'm, I would just go through and do all my finish edits. I mean, you can see the end result of blending all the images that I captured that day is, is this one just massive panorama that we looked at earlier. I'm actually, hold on, I'm going to jump over into browse to take a look at that. We don't necessarily need to see it here and develop, but um, it's, it's, just, it's just a great way to capture more pixels and have an image that you can just do more with. You know, I, I recently did an exhibition of images at one of the commercial spaces here in Portland, this big industrial building that has a lot of creative agencies in it. And, and it's actually still hanging right now. It's in the um, the OMCC, the, the um, Olympic Mills Commerce, Commerce Center. And I did like seven giant panoramas and one of them is 16 feet wide and it just looks beautiful when you walk up and put your nose to it. And that's just, you know, what panoramas get for you. And you may not think, well, you know, why do I need that right now? Well, you might a few years in the future have an application where you want a huge print and it just really gives you flexibility to work with images. Plus it's, it's fun. We can do it now. Why not do it? So, um, you know, I, I can go in and show you a whole bunch of stuff. One thing I'm going to show you here, here, this is, we did this one image where I, I, I did the, uh, the bracketed series later on in the day, I saw some people from my workshop and some other people just hiking up the trail in front of that. And I just kind of underexposed it to make sure I didn't blow out the sky and I overdid it. And I think this shows the power of the raw processor in uh, photo raw 2018. And it shows just what's capable with the Nikon D850 for those of you asking about that camera. If I go ahead, jump into develop here with this really underexposed image, I'll just show you how much shadow detail is available to you guys, um, you know, with the, with a modern camera and this raw processor. So you can see I'm really blocked up. I don't even have anything in the quarter tones. I mean, it's, it's all in the shadows and the blacks here. So the first thing I'm going to do with an image that's really underexposed like this is just pull exposure. I'm going to hold down that J key and I can pull exposure all the way up to where I'm losing the sky. I don't want to do that. I'm going to go to where I'm not really losing any data at all, but I've spread that across the histogram a bit and I'll, I'll move the whites just a little bit and the highlights just a little bit to kind of spread that data out here on this edge of the histogram. Uh, for those of you that aren't so familiar working with histograms on your camera or in your editing software, this right side of the histogram represents pure white. 
and the left side of the histogram represents pure black. And so dead in the center is kind of your straight up midtones. If it were a black and white image, it would be pure neutral gray, 50% uh, of the way between black and white. But in all the different color channels, it's, it's doing the same thing. You can see which color channels are which by whether it's blue or red or green or the blending of those. And, and so then the same thing, I wanna use the blacks. I'm gonna hold down the J key and pull that black slider to where I'm just barely clipping a few blacks, some black shadows maybe under these rocks right here. And then I'm gonna work with the shadow portion of my image and look, there it is. It's just all coming back. Isn't that just amazing? Um, and <laughs> then you can, you can sort of move the mid-tone slider around. This is a new innovation that only on one has to my knowledge, I, although I haven't looked at Capture Raw, for, Cap, Capture One for a little bit. But I really like the fact that you can just play with the middle part of this histogram and, and get that the midtones right where you want them. And then the last thing I tend to do is kind of look at what contrast is doing to the image. You know, I might add just a hint. Um, I might take a look at the uh, the sharpness of the image at this stage. And you know, our raw files tend to be a little less than razor sharp. Film was actually sharper. Um, if you photograph a JPEG in your camera, your camera is going to apply a default, a default amount of sharpening to the image just to make it look sharp before it bakes it in and throws away all that raw data. So in this case, I'm going to hold down the option key to just get a black and white view while I do this and, and just, uh, just pull the sharpening to where it looks a little bit more more crisp to me. And it's often in this range between 40 and 60 for landscape images. I'm always careful about sharp, sharpening portraits because you're actually often kind of adding detail to blemishes in the face and to lines and wrinkles people don't want sharpened. Um, so there you go, there's that. And then I'll do that same thing I did in the image before. I'll, I'll grab my local adjustment brush. I'll, I'll just flip it over here so that I'm really working with the, the shadowy bottom part of the image. And I might go in here and just boost exposure even a little bit more just to kind of get that group of people. You know, I've got one of my students, Dane, walking up behind here. Um, and that's that's actually one of my students in the back there. And then there's three hikers that just happen to be coming through. And, you know, before I go in and, and work on it in effects, I'll jump in here in the overall settings and effects. And I think that... It's really important for you guys to think about this. I'm going to use one of my uh, one of my presets here. Um, I'm going to actually jump in and use one of my uh, autumn styles on this. But before you ever go in and, and use a preset, uh, you definitely want to have your 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 basic underlying tones done in your image. And I don't know why it's not. Doesn't seem like it's. Uh, like it's baking in my develop settings, that's weird. Normally that would not happen. I'm gonna take a look at it from here and see if that jars it a little bit. Autumn styles, there we go. I don't know why it did that, some little little bug, but I haven't seen that before. I'm gonna take a look at these, these thumbnails, have them build really big. And, and the thing I was trying to say before I kind of had that little glitch was that it's really important that you adjust the tone and color of your image and develop and effects before you decide to go in, or develop, before you go in and decide to apply an effects preset. Because otherwise you're not gonna really get a good view of what the image looks like. I think step one is always go into develop, set your black point, set your white point, move shadows, move highlights, move midtones, get that underlying tonal look that you want. And then you can really see what these presets are gonna do. These, these are my new autumn presets that I built for Photo Raw. You know, and, and I can just go in here and find the one that's given me exactly the look I want. I, I kind of like this warm reflections for this particular image. So if I take a look at it, uh, I got some weird stuff happening. It's, it's just got to load the whole preview. We're just not seeing all the work that we've done. There you go. You know, if I was to, to go in here and reset our settings, here's what it looked like before we started. Pfft, huge, huge difference. And, and that whole, I'm gonna just hit Control Z here and, and undo that. The whole, um, the whole thing is, is just uh, a, a major importance that before you go applying presets, I think presets have to be the last step. And even after you've applied your preset, you know, th this one seems to work really well, 
but sometimes you'll find that there's a little haloing happening. Maybe the rock's a little too orange for you. Maybe the sky's not quite blue enough. You know, I think in this case, I might jump into my color enhancing filter here and have a look at the blues and maybe just boost or pull the brightness down a little bit in the blues, get that sky a little bit darker, see how that's affecting the sky, and then boost the saturation just a little bit. Bring those blues up just a little bit, add a little more drama in that sky. I think that you should always think about a preset being kind of a starting point for your finish editing and not necessarily the, the final point. You can always jump in here after you've applied anybody's preset your own, whether you get mine and my photo kit, this new set, whether you're, you're working with some of Matt's presets, anybody's, um, they're not really designed specifically for the image that you're working with. They're designed to get you a good starting point and, and, and an idea for the final look. And then you're going to go through it and tweak things a little bit. You know, maybe you say that's a little too much dynamic contrast as sharp as I made those rocks in the first place. So I can back that dynamic contrast filters opacity down just a little bit. You're going to go through and just get that look that you want, you know, and I think that you can just see we've, we've done a whole, lot to this really underexposed image and it showcases what's possible with this raw processor how powerful it is and also just how good my new nikon d850 is and, and that's right there illustrates one of the reasons why i love it so what else do we have for questions michael you know we actually have a few uh setup questions um just about how you approach capturing your hdr images these images um, I don't know if you want to talk about that a little right now. We have a few questions on the different brushes and when uh -huh. it's optimal to use the perfect brush versus just the regular masking brush. Uh, you covered that a little bit, but maybe on your next image, just cover how you use that perfect brush on the edge a little bit. That'd probably be a little helpful. And okay. uh, otherwise, yeah, just, just keep on cruising through. You're doing great. You know, I, I, quick, t I'll try to, you know, we've got 20 minutes here. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how I approach scenes in general. You know, I think that the, the first thing when I'm, if you haven't watched the Approaching the Scene um, series or my Landscape and Travel series, you know, if you have, my apologies, because you probably heard me talk about this ad nauseum. But if you if you haven't watched those, if you're not in plus and, and you haven't been watching those those courses, um, you know I think that this waterfall image illustrates a lot about what I'm looking for when I approach a scene. So I'm drawn to this background. I love this waterfall. This is Lower North Falls at at Silver Creek State Park. It's kind of the crown jewel of Oregon state park systems. It's this really really beautiful canyon with 11 waterfalls, uh, and and it's just gorgeous trails through it. I love running workshops here. Um, and so, you know, the, the thing I found was this waterfall and my students and I climbed down to this little beach and there were these big logs along the beach and there's lots of little rocks and different features, you know, little, little cascades and glides to find as foreground. And we talked about a lot of them. And, and I found this beautiful red leaf that was, that was, had just fallen off of one of the trees on the shore and we passed it around, different people used it, propped. And then, and then I saw there was this really beautiful rock that was kind of in this cascady glide. And I climbed out on some rocks over a log and got my tripod set up in the water just inches above this. And I found a way to compose the scene where I'm, I'm looking for lines and I'm looking for some large uh, foreground subject that kind of anchors the viewer in the scene, something you can connect with in the foreground, and then a way to use lines that are happening in the image to kind of lead you to the background, that leads that eye to the background fall. So this little piece of downed wood, this stone, you know, just the waterfall running through as a whole, that really pulled me in. And I like the way that it moves us up and then this log that's fallen down and become just a piece of the waterfall over the years. I just like the way the whole thing worked together. I spent a lot of time, uh, you know, getting my tripod set up with the creek flowing around it and getting this image dialed in where I wanted it. Uh, and, and then, you know, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to focus my camera to infinity at, you know, say F11, because I know I want to try to get as much in, in focus as possible. I'm photographing this. I'm pretty sure I was all the way out at 14 millimeters. Let's have a look here. Um, I photographed this at, oh, 20 millimeters. So I zoomed in a little bit. And that robs me of a little depth of field. You know, the wider the angle you're using, the more depth of field you have. And, and 
I zoomed in all the way on this log in the background. That's this thing I know that's in infinity. And I started focusing the lens closer and closer to me away from infinity until I saw that log start to really lose sharpness in live view, zoomed in 100% in the background. And, and I could tell, ooh, you know what? I, I can't get I can't get any more depth of field at f11 and still have infinity in focus. So I moved back to where it's still sharp. And then I just moved my view down to where I'm looking at this rock and this leaf, and I saw they were out of focus. And that's the moment that I know, you know, either I have to stop my lens down considerably more, a, a narrower aperture to increase depth of field, or I'm going to need to make multiple exposures. So I went ahead and snapped an image of that background, you know, with, with hyperfocal distance set, I've found it. Uh, and then I keeping my view on this leaf, I started focusing closer and closer until it just came razor sharp into focus. Cause I know that the front of this rock is the closest element in my scene. And I snapped another image and I knew I had the whole scene in focus because you know, my, my depth of field at that wide angle is gonna reach at least halfway into the scene from each direction. If I wanted to be extremely careful, if I had a lot of depth of field or I was using a longer lens, I might take another image focused on this rock and another focused there and, and have everything I need to blend. But I knew that I would have everything in focus. So you know, I think that my approach to a scene is find some piece of interesting foreground that the viewer can connect with that really gives us a place to rest the eye and then and then set it off against that background and and you know work with your tripod take your time get the composition look at the edges try to find the, a way that there aren't any distractions you know in this case you could call this little bit of rock right here a distraction and this could be an excellent opportunity right after we're done with this i'll show you how i would use the perfect eraser to get rid of that and why i think the perfect eraser is such a good tool for that um but you know I, then i'm going to look at focus i'm going to get as focused as possible and i'm going to check and make sure that everything i want in focus is in focus and then finally i'm going to think about I'm gonna capture the image and take a look if there's really high contrast. You know, here obviously this is an overcast day in the woods, everything's nice and evenly lit. I'm not worried about having a lot of contrast and having to do an HDR or something. So I'm actually going to uh, to, to to think about focus, then tone, and if I can't capture the whole scene in an image, then I'll think about bracketing. And I find that with these modern sensors in both my Sony cameras and my Nikon cameras, which the Nikons I use have Sony made sensors, um, are, are fine in almost any situation with three images uh, bracketed two stops apart. So when we when we looked at that that HDR image earlier, I think that uh, the bracketing, my standard bracketing setting is two stops underexposed on the meter, two stops overexposed. So that's sort of my approach to photographing landscapes. When I'm photographing moving subjects or situations with changing light handheld, I generally use aperture priority and I leave auto ISO turned on with a maximum setting locked in in my in my menu that you know I use my cameras a lot and I figure out what setting am I comfortable with. With the new Nikon D850, I, I have no problem setting that at 64,000 ISO. Uh, I know that I'm going to get images that I can do some noise reduction and have fine images for the web and, and, and small prints. No problem at 64,000 ISO. So I tend to run with that auto ISO turned on, handheld and aperture priority, and just kind of keep an eye on the settings and run and gun, and I know the meter is going to do a good job. Um, and now for talking about brushes really quickly, um, you know, I think masking brushes are one thing. The healing brush and the perfect brush are, are something different. They're for, for getting rid of distractions. Um, you know, and like I said, sensor dust or flotsam on the stream, the, the healing brush is just fine for that. You know, you can, you can maybe zoom in when you're going to do this. Often I'll go to the nav screen and maybe hit 25% since this is such a big file or 50%. And, and move over to where I'm having a nice good view of this flotsam. And if I wanted to get rid of it, I can use this this healing brush and just zap and it'll it'll do a really nice job with pimples on people, with sensor dust, you know, simple to remove things. It does a really, really great job just kind of blending it into the surrounding. If instead I want to get something rid of something that's a little bit more complex, you know, that's got some more texture to it, 
if I start using the healing brush, it's probably going to kind of do a little bit of cloning of that thing into the scene. If I use the perfect eraser, honestly, I don't even know how Dan and the engineers at OnOne did it, but this thing has some kind of crazy algorithm where it really does this content aware move and it kind of looks at everything surrounding. And generally, all I have to do is a move like that, and, and it may take it a little bit of time, but it will probably, yeah, just blend it into the scene in a magical way that usually one hit and it's done. If Sometimes there's a little remnant or something, I'll just zap it again. And it does this magical job of blending it in with the same kind of texture and color. And it's, it's like the thing was never there. I mean, I've used it to do some really complicated things. You know, if I wanted to get rid of this little pine needle, I'd just shrink it down to where it's kind of pine needle size and draw it out. And I'll bet you'll have a really hard time telling where that was on the rock. Um, you know, it's just, it's just my go-to when I want to do something complicated. I know I'm going to use the perfect eraser. When I want to do something simple, I use the retouch brush cause it's quicker. Um, so hopefully that answers that question for you. And, and we're down to about 10 minutes or so. So do you, do you have any more stuff you want to get answered or shall I just keep rolling with stuff, Michael? Um, you know, I'd keep rolling with stuff right now. Um, there's a couple questions just about how you are blending the images with the leaf, but uh, we can we can talk about that near the end about your photo kit. So why don't you just jump over to the next image and keep going away? You got it. All right. So you know, I think another one um, that that I, I want to talk about quick is this photo of Stacy and Pepper. Uh, if you guys haven't seen my newest little little girl, she's she's pretty adorable. We had her dressed up as a pepper for Halloween. And this is one of those situations I talk about where I'm hand holding. It's in really complicated light. We we took the kids to Moab. I think the Stacy and the family flew in on the 30th and I drove the Sprinter van for the workshop over and, and got there the same day. And so we had Halloween in Moab, which was really fun. And we just went trick or treating through the neighborhoods. Uh, and and it was you know super low light. Um, I, I took the Nikon D850 with me just with a 50 millimeter lens, and I was really helping Pike go door to door. But this fence was all lit up, and I just had Stacy go over and sit by it with Pepper. And I got this shot that I really like. Now there's there's some noise in this image, obviously, because I'm photographing it at um, 4,000 ISO with the D850, which is you know a high megapixel camera. So you know, it it's not perfect. I'm, I'm hand holding in really low light. It's certainly good for sharing on the web or uh, printing eight by 10. I don't know that I'd ever blow it up really big, but it's not that kind of image anyway. It's more of a family snapshot or something to just put on the wall eight by 10. But I do want to get the noise reduced as much as possible. So I'm going to go in here and just sort of show you how I dealt with that in the noise reduction and how I do approach this kind of thing. So I'm going to turn everything off that I've done here and show you what it looked like straight raw. Quite a bit of noise. And, and what I do first when I have a noisy image like this is here in develop, I take the raw file, I've got my tonal adjustments done, and I'm going to go ahead and just grab that luminance slider. I'm going to hold down the option key. Uh, J key is going to show us tonal uh, movements. When we're working with sharpening and noise reduction, you want to hold down the option key. It's just like it is in Lightroom. And, and I'm just going to move that luminance slider. It's going to give me a black and white view. And that way, if there's any color noise in the image, it's not interfering with my view of this, uh, of this luminance noise that's happening. And you can see as I move this slider, the image is getting less sharp. I mean, that's how noise reduction works. It winds up blurring little micro detail and, and that gets rid of the noise with a little bit of a blur. So I think it's really good. You know, I, I talked a lot with Dan when they were putting Photo Raw 2017 together about making sure that sharpening and noise reduction are right in the same place so that you can be looking at them together and that the controls work together. Because I want to I wanna pull some sharpness back into the image. I always want to be viewing it at 100%. You know, now this is a a 46 megapixel image. So I know, you know, and it's at 4,000 ISO. So I know it's not going to be razor sharp, but by pulling this masking slider after kind of getting the sharpening back where I want it, I can, I can target, you know, if I let go of it, it's getting some of that underlying noise, but I don't want to be sharpening any of the noise that remains in this image. And it's also giving me a view of, you know, 
how much noise is remaining out there? And I might want to pull that luminance slider even a little bit more. I kind of do this back and forth game, kind of checking it with masking. You know, how am I doing? I'm getting rid of more. And then, you know, I get it to a place where it's it's certainly better than when I started. And it's going to, you know, I don't want to lose too much sharpness in the image. Another thing I can do is pull the detail slider under the luminance. And that'll that'll save a little bit of underlying detail. You can watch her little eyelids. As I'm moving it, there's going to be a point where it's kind of at its best, you know. And it's, it's a little closer to the left. And again, you know, I may want to add even a little bit more sharpening back in. It's a dance, you know. There's no way with an image like this that you're going to get it razor sharp and noise free, but you just kind of go back and forth with it. Um, it's kind of an art. And I think that whenever you're working with these things, make sure that you think about sharpening being one side of the coin, noise reduction being the other, because as you reduce that noise, you're also reducing sharpening. So you're going to be adding sharpening back. And you can see, you know, if I, if I go in here in the nav view and take a look at this at 25% or at 50%, it's going to be plenty good for certainly sharing on the web and for printing five by seven or eight by 10. I think it's great. And it certainly looks better than it did with all the noise in it. So, you know, um, the 4,000 ISO, you're only going to get so good, but the same thing's true if you're working with a star image and you're just going to have to work with the, with the shadow detail in there. Um, so I hope that helps a little bit with thinking about how you're going to deal with, with noise and sharpening when you're working in photo raw. That's something I hadn't talked about. And, and you know, another thing that I to think about is when we work with landscape images, I think you're almost always going to want to add somewhere between 40 and 60 uh, of sharpening. Even if you're, you know, you're not, hopefully you're not shooting at anything but your base ISO when you're doing landscape images. So you don't have to worry about noise reduction at all. But um, you still want to do a little bit of sharpening to each image just because raw files tend to be kind of a little less than sharp straight out of the camera. Um, you know, another thing I want to talk about really briefly is the fact that it's, it's I often, um, I, I work with a Google Pixel phone and I, all my photos are automatically uploaded to Google Photos and I'll just bring those images into folders on my hard drive and include them. And I just want to showcase, you know, this image I was scouting at Moab before my students arrived. I didn't even have the big camera with me. And there was this really dramatic morning in uh, in Park Avenue as I went in there with the family. And I just took my Pixel phone, threw it into manual mode. Um, I use um, Lightroom's, Lightroom's free CC mobile camera, which lets you lock in manual settings just like it was a big camera. Um, and that's true. That's available for iPhone and Android for free. It's just a free app for mobile and it lets you lock in manual exposure. Um, and I went ahead and just captured this as a panorama. And, you know, I mean, it's a phone photo. It's, it's, but still pretty darn incredible levels of detail. And, you know, don't think you can't work on your phone photos in Photo Raw. It, it works fantastic. You know, this was one frame out of my camera, just kind of straight out of the camera without any Photo Raw edits. Um, versus, you know, what I could capture doing a little pano with it. And actually, there's a, a whole book on panos. I just published the first of two books on, on simple panoramas, and it's 62 pages. It covers using your phone and using your bigger cameras to do panoramas, and that's in that photo kit too. So um, there you go. So I will, I will go ahead and send out a link to your photo kit if anyone is interested in checking that out. Um, I'll put that in the chat window there for everyone. Um, there are a couple there's of questions. A lot, there's a lot in that about blending images in Photo Raw, whether it's for focus blending, whether it's HDR, or whether it's panos, both how to shoot in the field and how to blend them in post-production. Awesome, awesome. So there was a question back on the image of uh, Stacy and Pepper about the uh, lighting um, in the scene and did you use a flash? Did you have like a handheld flash, just camera flash for that? Anything you know, the specific? D850, if I have one complaint with the D850 is that it does not have an onboard flash. Um, it has the nicest viewfinder I've ever seen, which I think took more space and they just got rid of the on-camera flash. So I've actually kept my D810 to control off-camera flashes with that on-camera flash in situations. But believe it or not, like I said, the 850 is kind of amazing. The only light in the scene 
is coming from a street light across the way and this fence with these little LED Christmas lights on it. No art, no light from me at all. <laughs> awesome. It's cool. Um, so last question here uh, before I let you go, Hudson. There are a ton of questions from the viewers here about getting their landscape images in focus. I don't know if there's a special metering mode you're using when shooting landscape versus, you know, spot metering for portraits. Um, any kind of tips you can leave with the viewers today about shooting better focus landscape images? You know, again, I, I think the image that I'd like to talk to you guys about that with is still this this focus image right here. Um, and the, the photo kit has a whole video on blending the two images that went into this and I discuss how I captured it in camera and I'm actually working on a book um, called Finding Focus that's going to be out really soon. It's going to be in the next month or maybe six weeks max. Um, it's coming out between the Pano 1 book and Pano 2 book. But, you know, I think a lot of people ask me about hyperfocal distance and about how to find hyperfocal distance. And they're downloading apps and they're getting charts for their lenses at different apertures. And I think, you know, you need to toss all that complexity out in my personal opinion. It's just, it's dead simple. You know, get on your tripod and get your live view activated on the back of the camera and just zoom in to 100% on the back of your camera. And it's taking a second to load this big file here. There we go. And you're just going to if you if you that you're going to go into manual focus so you're shooting a landscape you should be on your tripod you should be locked in tight and and go into manual focus zoom in on the back of the screen and if you're a person who wears reading glasses to view close up you know i'm 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 getting to where reading glasses are a really nice thing for focusing and i tend to keep a little tiny pair with me i don't really use them for anything except that that legal fine print on prescription bottles and for focusing in landscapes but I'll throw them on, zoom into 100%, and I'm looking at something in the scene that I know is at infinity, something way out in the distance, whether it's mountains. In this scene, it's this waterfall and this log. And, and I'm just going to I'm gonna, you know, select the aperture I want to photograph this scene at. So for in this case, you know, I think it was f11. And, and I'm just going to, yeah, in fact, it is f11, half a second at f11. And I'm just going to start dialing that manual focus away from infinity towards closer and closer to me until I see the background start to lose focus. And then I go back to where it's still sharp. And I know that in doing that, I've got as close as I possibly can in focus to me while keeping infinity in focus. If I move to clo focus on anything closer, it's going to lose infinity. And that's the definition of hyperfocal distance. You just found it just by zooming in and looking at the distance and turning that dial until you see it. You can actually see it. You're looking live at what the sensor sees through your lens. It doesn't matter whether you're using a mirrorless camera or a camera with a mirror and you're in live view with it locked up looking at what the sensor sees. You know, the key is 100% zoom into infinity and then just start moving that manual focus closer than infinity until you lose that, that bit of focus. And then without touching anything, just scroll down and have a look at your foreground. If it's razor sharp and in focus, you're done. You got it. No problem. If not, you have a choice. You can either ratchet in some smaller aperture, you know, a higher aperture number. Maybe you go up to f22 and you risk inducing a little bit of diffraction. You have to know how your lens performs at that aperture. You can do some tests. Um, or, you know, focus closer until that foreground gets in focus and take a picture at each focus setting. One set up at hyperfocal distance, one at what I like to call reverse hyperfocal distance, where you're, everything's sharp from close to you to as far away. You know, just if you're at hyper, hyperfocal distance and you take the image and then you just slowly start focusing closer and closer while you're zoomed in at 100% on your closest element in the scene, in this case, this leaf, well, the minute that that leaf becomes sharp, You've got everything as close to you as you need in focus, and that zone zone of focus reaches out towards the middle of the scene as far as it can. And that's my key. That's my key for capturing images. I'm doing more and more focus blending as the months go on. Um, it's just a way to ensure that you've got everything you want sharp. Awesome. Awesome. 
Well, I think uh, that that pretty much wraps us up for today, Hudson. So thank you very much for being here with us. Uh, I don't know if you have any final parting thoughts you'd like to leave with the viewers. Hey, you guys. I hope you all had a really great time with family for the holidays. Uh, I know we did. We, we got a bunch of family together, ate a bunch of good food, had a ton of fun with the kids. And I hope that that keeps rolling for everybody right through Christmas. You know, I know it's a crazy, hectic wild time but you know get those cameras out get lots of snaps of family and the kids and lights and you know use use wide apertures get great pictures of the family with blurred christmas trees in the background and just eat <laughs> and enjoy and have a good time for the holiday awesome awesome well thanks again hudson and thank you everyone for being here with us today this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on our blog i'll try and get that up for you today just on one.com slash blog so Hudson, thank you very much for being here. Everyone else, have a great week and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, everybody. And see ya.